it is our lesson one video notes for our chapter nine, Ancient India. We're going to be looking at several different civilizations that arose in India and also talking about some fantastic ideas and religions and cultures that might be a little unique and new to you. So please make sure that as we're watching, we're listening carefully. We're making good choices about writing down all of the information that I asked you to do. Today we're going to start by looking at that geography like we always do and we're going to see how it shaped the rise of the first civilizations in the Indus River Valley. But before we can talk about the Indus River Valley we need an idea of where India is in general in comparison to some of the other places that we've been looking at. So let's take a look at our globe real quick. We've spent a lot of time here in Mesopotamia with our fertile crescent, and then also here in Egypt. And if you look closely, you can just see the Nile River. So we've spent time on the continent of Africa and a little bit on this continent as well, Asia. We're gonna be moving further into Asia and looking at our subcontinent. Remember, that's that area of land that is smaller than a continent, but larger than just, say, a country. Our subcontinent of India. Today, there are several different countries that make up this subcontinent. Um, and so the cultures that we are going to be talking about don't just take place in what is modern day India, um, but we're going to see that they're all on the subcontinent. Now, you might be looking, if you've been paying attention, for the rivers. We have two rivers that we're going to talk about, and they're going to be right here and right there, coming down from that mountain range. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in just a moment, but I just wanted you to get an idea of where it is we're going to be looking. So India and its surrounding modern day countries make up that subcontinent. It's not quite big enough to be a continent. We're subtracting a little bit for that subcontinent. So we subtract a little bit from a continent, we get a subcontinent. Let's talk a little bit about some of the geographic features of India so you can kind of understand. Now, the Indian subcontinent is huge, and there's lots of different regions. Just like in the United States, we have deserts and mountains and areas that are very cold this time of year and areas like ours that are very hot. So it's important to understand that there is a lot of variety, but there are some things that affect the entire subcontinent. For example, the mountains. We have the Himalayan mountains to the north and the eastern and western ghats that run along the coastlines. So if we take a look at this map, we see that we have a range of mountains that runs right up along the northern part of India. And then we're also going to have mountains that run down the coastline. Okay, so very, very mountainous. We have a lot of areas that it makes it very hard to travel through because, well, we can't get past the mountains. There might be some narrow passages for people to travel in and out of, but for the most part, we become isolated. Also, because we have water on either side, we become isolated there. We also have two rivers. We have the Ganges River in the northeast, so the top left or top right and the Indus River in the northwest and we're going to practice drawing these and these bring fertile soil to the north of India. So I want you to write on your notes that civilization and you can just shorten that to civ if you want. Civ came in the Indus. Okay, meaning that our first civilizations are going to start in that Indus River. And we're going to practice that more. But really that fertile soil is that important part because then we know we can farm. So if we take a look here, we've got our, oops, had the bell. We have our Indus River up here and our Ganges River. And the first settlers in India settled along that Indus River. We watched that video about Mohenjo-Daro, that city. They're going to be right here, okay? And then eventually over time they spread down, but we're going to start right here on that Indus River Valley. 
Now, we also have plateaus. Plateau is a flat, a flat area of high land, and it covers about two thirds of India, the Deccan Plateau does. Um, and I'll bring up the map again. That's that region between those two mountains. So it's much harder to farm there. Oh, you can, but for the most part, that area is not as well populated. So when we look at our map, oh, well, let me go back. When we look at our map, we'll see that area kind of right in the middle of India. And the last thing we want to know, and I want you to put a star or circle or somehow indicate these monsoons. These are really important. This is how in the winter cold dry air gets blown down from the Himalayan mountains and in the summer we don't get just a little bit of rain from um, the rivers. We get warm wet air and pouring rains coming off of the ocean. So let's take a look at this map. So in the winter it's cold and dry. In the summer it's warm and wet. Kind of like here in Florida. So here's our map. In the winter, we have cold winds. Here, I'll do blue. We have cold winds that blow down off the mountain, okay? Kind of like you're blowing a fan over an ice cube. You're gonna blow them down and it dries out. But in the summertime, those winds shift and they bring a bunch of water up out of the ocean and dump it all onto the subcontinent. So in the summer, you get these incredibly heavy rains, kind of like what we get here in Florida. And you'll notice, we we're talking about that plateau, there it is right in the middle between those two mountain ranges. So we've got mountains, 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 and then all these down here, okay? So in the winter, cold, summer, hot and wet. Here's some pictures of the monsoons. Even today, this is a major thing. We know around here that when we get heavy enough rains, it floods very easily. Same thing in India today. The monsoons can dump huge amounts of rain in a very short period of time. Now, we know that's great if we need to grow crops for food. We've got our rivers that end up flooding and bringing all that fertile soil down, but it can also be very dangerous. And you've got, you know, all sorts of problems like this picture here on the left where it's just hard to get around. Um, there could be drownings and it's just, um, you know, kind of a two edged coin. There's really good things about the monsoons, but there's also very dangerous things. Now, think about this hot question. What might happen to India's farmers if the monsoon's rains did not come? Think about their supply of water and what happens if farmers can't get enough water to provide for their crops. Okay, so think about that. Give me two to three sentences at the very least and then we'll move on. Oh, and there's a picture of those um, farmers who are taking advantage of that monsoon rain to uh, water their crops. So what would happen if they didn't have that rain? So let's take a minute to talk about what life would have been like in this earliest civilization along the Indus River. We've got two main cities here, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, okay? We see them right here. They're both along the Indus River and they have a lot of similarities. In fact, they're almost identical. So let's talk about what it would have been like. And we did watch a short video in class about these. And if you haven't watched it, you're going to see it soon. So the city layout was really well planned. It was laid out on a grid. And I want you to put a star by the fact that it was well planned. That's a lousy star. Let me rewrite that one. Burp, burp. Okay, well, that's kind of a better start, okay? So take a look over here at this grid. All the streets are laid out nice and easily. That doesn't just happen by nature. You have to actually plan that. The streets were all paved with bricks, so it would have been easy, not just mud streets, um, nice and easy to carry carts around, all sorts of stuff. They had bathrooms that were indoors, so we had indoor plumbing before thousands of years before the rest of Europe. So that's pretty awesome to think about the fact we didn't have to worry about, um, you know, going outside. We had a whole system to take the water out from the houses into what we needed. And those houses had flat wooden roofs, kind of like what we saw in Egypt. You see a picture of a house over here. Um, again, to catch those nice breezes and people spent a lot of time outside. So on one end of the city, 
was the fortress at the west end of the city. And another word for this is the citadel. C-I-T-A-D-E-L. And I want you to write that word in by the word fortress. So we know that they planned ahead for attacks and military. Um, and this one is a big part of it. And they used all sorts of mud bricks for building materials so that they would bake in the hot sun and be able to be well preserved. About 1900 BC, the people of the Indus Valley, Valley began to abandon their cities. So we're not really sure why they left their cities, but we do have some possible causes. There could have been an earthquake or flood. The rivers could have changed course a little bit, making it harder to bring water, or there could have been drought. But for a long time, those cities kind of stood unused, maybe small tribes coming in. But in the meantime, a civilization called the Aryans migrated to India. I want you to put a star by this and circle it because most of Indian culture today started with the Aryans. Now let's talk a little bit about what Aryan society would have been like. They lived in tribes led by rajas or princes. So there's no centralized government here. Everybody's kind of on their own. It's kind of like those city-states in ancient Mesopotamia. They developed a written language called Sanskrit. And we've seen this word before. Um, and so we see this beautiful written language. And a lot of what we know about the Aryans is because they didn't just have a written language. They wrote down a collection of sacred, or another word for sacred is holy texts known as the Vedas. So these Vedas are the holy books of the Aryan society. Now, in Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, most of the houses were the same size. There doesn't seem to be really huge temples, so we think that most people were relatively equal. But in the Aryans, we see a change here. We see a very strict system dividing up people. And this is something that's going to continue forward in India for many, many thousands of years. Now, the family was the center of life, and men had more rights than women. And then we had their organization, their caste system. So take a look at the pyramid. At the very top are the priests, the Brahmins, Brahmins. Okay, they've got the word men in it. So we've got the people who were um, in charge of religion at the very top. So we learned a word about that. It's called a theocracy. Below that was the Kshatriyas, the warrior and ruler class. Okay, so like Mesopotamia, the military leaders and the rulers would have been on the second level. Then we have the merchants and farmers, the Vyasas. And at the very bottom are the common workers and laborers and the peasants. Now, you'll notice that each level gets a little bit bigger. So there would be a smaller number of people here, and then it would get larger as we go. But something that's different from other societies that we've learned about are these untouchables. There was a group of people in ancient Indian society that was considered so low that they were completely off the social pyramid. So you notice here, everybody else is on the pyramid. They're kind of in the mud below it. In our next video note, we'll talk about why the Aryans and later Indians thought that this was acceptable or why they put this group below because there was a reason for it. But these were the people that would do all the dirty work, whether it was killing animals or maybe they were the ones who were scrubbing out those, um, those sewers. They would be the ones who would be forced to do all the dirty work. And it was a very, very hard life. And these levels, once you were born into them, guys, once you were born into this caste system, you could not ever move up or down. And we'll talk about why ancient Indians believed that you were kind of stuck at that level and how you might be able to change your outcome. But if you were born into a level, they believed that that's where you stay. The last thing we're going to talk about today is what the name of this system is. Now, we're going to call this a caste system, C-A-S-T-E. And I want you to make sure that you write that in, the caste system, and you make sure, guys, that as we reference this, we know a couple important things. One, you're born into it. 
Whatever your parents' level is, that's what you are. Two, you can't move up and down at all. And three, there was a group called the Untouchables that were not allowed to leave their groups at all and were considered so low that they weren't even part of the system. We'll talk more about the reasoning behind that and why it is when we get to lesson two. So please be sure that you are taking good notes and we'll talk more about this in class. See you soon guys, have a great day.